that I'm on. Uh, but today's sermon is the conclusion of our four-part sermon, and by its nature, it's a little shorter than the others. And so I want to spend a moment first talking to you about a, a time that when I was overseas, uh, Memorial Day meant something particularly wonderful to me. There was a man in uh, the small farm town of Mainong who paid me very well to come for two hours every Saturday night and just talk to his high school daughter and junior high son. Now, these two children had pretty good English, but he was paying me to talk to them about intellectual things and political things and religious things because he wanted them to expand their vocabulary past what the schools were teaching them. You know, you, you go to school and learn a foreign language, and what do you learn? Hello, how are you? I'm fine, and you? You know, and that's just not the kind of conversation that people naturally have. And around a Memorial Day weekend, we were talking about the value of remembering our fallen soldiers. And this high school girl just couldn't understand it to honor those who had fallen. And so I told her a story that we've heard many times, the idea of soldiers in a foxhole, when suddenly an enemy hand grenade falls into the foxhole, and in an instant, one young private who is not married and has no children thinks of the corporals and the sergeants and the other privates around him who have something to go home to. And he throws his own body on the hand grenade and sacrifices his life so that others will go home. And this young, very smart Taiwanese girl looked at me and squinted her eyes and she said, how selfish. And I said, Carolyn, I don't think you understand the meaning of the word selfish. She goes, oh, he was very selfish. He was just getting glory when what he needed to do was get home and take care of his family. And now his family will have no one to take care of them. How selfish. I said, Carolyn, had he not thrown himself on the hand grenade, all of them would be dead. None of them would go home. And she looks at me, she says, well, you don't know that. Maybe they would have just all been injured. No, they would have all died. And so he gave his one life to save many others. And that conversation turned into the Jesus who gave one life to save many others because those others were destined for death. It took her about three months before she kind of came to me and said, I think maybe selfish was not the right word. <laughs> Folks, I, 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 will, I will say to you that I believe with all my heart that it is the Christian message. It is the message of God that has brought to this world the idea of self-sacrifice so that others may live. Because I've lived in Buddhist and Taoist countries where the soldiers have said to me directly that if a bigger army comes to invade their country, they'll just give up. They don't want to die for their country. But we have learned that there is a love that is greater. And that's to give up one's own life so that others may live. And we learn that from God Himself. Let's finish our stories here of, of Luke chapter 10 where we are now to the end of our presentation of the gospel to someone that we love, and now it is time to tell them. Jesus gives us his directive in Luke 10 to go into a house and declare peace, and then to eat with them, and then to pray for them and heal them, and then to tell them that the kingdom of God has come to them. There is a reason that Jesus gives this order, peace, eating, healing, and talking. The church does it backwards today. We tell them first, and if they will listen, 
And if they will accept, well, then we'll give them services. Then we will feed them or care for them or take them to the hospital. And once they have gotten to where we think they're good enough, then we'll sit down and eat with them. And then once they've proven that they will not hurt us emotionally, then we'll declare peace. But Jesus said, first you show that we Christians, we people of the Word of God, we have peace already. And we're not mad at anybody. And it's not our job to judge anyone. It might be our job to point out from the Scripture that something is a sin, but when we do that, we point to ourselves as well and say, we too are sinners. There is peace. And then we spend time fellowshipping and getting to know them and being part of the family and showing that friendship does not come at the cost of agreement. I think you would all see right now on the news every day that making agreement the cost of friendship is tearing our country to pieces regardless of religion. If you don't agree with me, you're not my friend. Well, that doesn't make a harmonious city. And then we heal them. We pray for them in those times that they have shown us how they're hurting, how they're suffering in this world. What are their difficulties? And we don't care whether they believe or they don't believe. We just say, I'm going to pray for you. And now we come to telling them. And what do we tell them? Man, you need to get Jesus. You need to get Jesus in your heart. No. No, Jesus has already come. And what we tell them is that the kingdom of God has come to you. You ever heard that Muslim phrase? If Muhammad cannot go to the mountain, the mountain will come to Muhammad. I don't care about mountains. They don't save anybody. If we won't go to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God will come looking for us. Like the shepherd that leaves the 99 sheep and goes and looks for the one. I've talked to shepherds. They say, no, that one's stupid. I'm going to leave him to die. i got to take care of these 99. But the good shepherd says, no, I'm, I'm after the lost ones. And so the kingdom of God comes to you. I am troubled by the number of pastors I've known in my life who do office hours, and they're always in the office. Not because I'm making an excuse for never being in the office. But their attitude of evangelism is, I have office hours, and if people want to know Jesus, they can make an appointment. Jesus, Sin is not a toothache. Toothaches hurt, and you make an appointment to get them fixed. Sin kind of feels good, and people don't look for a salva salvation. The kingdom of God has to come to them. So what do you tell them? What does it mean to say to them, the kingdom of God has come to them? What does that even mean? It's come to them. There are two words that we use in the Christian world, and I think we've used them so often that we've forgotten their true definitions. We kind of think we know what they mean, but we don't use them correctly to know what they mean. If we watch them on a TV show with policemen and judges and lawyers, we know exactly what they mean. But when we use them in the church... We think they mean something different, and they don't. The first word is witness. How many Christians did you talk? You've, they say, I'm going to go witness. And they mean they're going to go tell people about Jesus from a script or from the five finger plan of salvation or from a tract. And the other word is testimony or testify. <laughs> Well, brother, brother, can you stand up and testify? And what they're saying is, I'm going to stand up and tell about something that's on my heart. If we are in a courtroom, we know exactly what those roles are. But in the church, we think there's something different. To witness. In the book of Acts, for you are to be His, God's witness, telling everyone what you have seen and what you have heard. That's what a witness does. What did you see? What did you hear? And that's where you get, you remember, remember Joe Friday? Some of you people under the age of 30 might not remember Joe Friday. 
Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. They write them down. They put them in a document. They make them history. This is what happened. Well, how do you know it happened? I have a witness. They saw it happen. When we tell people the kingdom of God has come near them, we don't do that by just saying, oh, the kingdom of God has come near you as a good feeling. We do that first by a witness. I saw the kingdom of God come near you. And you think, well, what I see? Well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. The word witness is a person who sees an event, typically a crime or accident or the signing of a document. As it takes place, they were there as it took place. The verb for witness is to actually see it take place, to be the one that saw or heard the event take place. It's that simple. When you come across a scripture or a preacher or a teaching in a book that says to you, as Christians, we need to go out and witness, you tend to get scared because you think, well, I didn't go to Bible college. Now, how many times do you think there's a car wreck and the policeman gets there and he gathers witnesses and he says, now, I want to take a statement of what you saw, but first, I need to know how many of you went to criminal justice school and have a degree in criminal justice? Right? No. What'd you see? And they'll, they'll take anybody's statement. Didn't matter if they finished high school or not. Because I just want to know what you saw. Our fear of witnessing comes from the fact that we think we have to be the expert witness. You don't. You just have to be the witness. Well, but what did I witness? Well, first of all, has Jesus done anything in your life at all? Tell him that. You see, in Taiwan, the Bible has no authority at all. Most people don't know what's in it. And frankly, coming back to America a decade later, I'm kind of feeling like it's that way here too. What affected people's lives when I witnessed to them in Taiwan? When I said, well, here's what happened to me. Here's what God did in my life. Here's what God did in my wife's life. Here's what God did in my grandfather's life. Those stories changed people's attitude about the Bible. We start with witnessing. What did you see? And testimony. We're told in the book of Acts again, and he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify what Jesus, or that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living, and the dead. What's a testimony? That's when the witness sits down in the dock or the, the, the chair. I'm using British English again. The dock is what they say. We say the witness stand. And that's when you tell what you saw. It's exactly that. It's, it's not opinions. It's not, it, it's not what you think happened. It's just what you saw. Witnessing is at the time. Testifying is later when you talk about what happened at the time. And that's it. It doesn't require Bible college. It doesn't require a seminar. It doesn't require the memorization of a plan. It simply means you paid attention when the thing happened. And you saw it. So, how do we witness and testify of Christ to our friends and family? Well, first of all, you declared peace. You ever watch those courtroom battles on TV where one of the witnesses doesn't like the person and they say, Your Honor, may I treat this as a hostile witness? You don't trust hostile witnesses, do you? And so if we're going around with banners saying, down with you people, and we're judging folks all the time, they don't trust our witness. So first we declare peace. And then we become family and friends by eating with them and sharing in hobbies with them and, and doing things with them that don't require any payment, such as agreement of ideas. Just, we get along. And then you pray for them. 
even if they don't care about prayer, they don't believe in prayer, you pray for them. And then they wonder, what just happened? And then you get to witness. You see, the witness sits in the dock, and the lawyer says to them, okay, tell us what happened. Tell us what you saw and what you heard at the time. And if the witness says, well, I think, the lawyer will stop them and say, no, tell us what you saw. Well, I saw Ralph driving a red van, and he went right through the stop sign. But I think he was, no, don't tell us what you think. What did you see? Well, then I saw Larry Simmons driving his car on the other road, and he stopped. But it's possible that he went to, no, don't tell us what's possible. What did you see? Well, I heard the two cars hit. You didn't see it? Well, I wasn't looking. I was cleaning the dirt out of my shoe. That's a good witness, folks. That's a good witness. I didn't see it, but I heard it. You see, the world doesn't want certainty out of us when we witness. They want honesty. Why did God do this to me? I don't know. That's honesty. Honesty is also saying, but here's what he did for me, and I didn't understand it either until later. Don't tell people what you think nearly as much as you tell them what you saw. Jesus says, my Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. I want to do a little experiment with you right now. I want to tell you the difference between opinion and and witnessing. What number between one and a million am I thinking of right now? Can you tell? Can you look at me and tell what number I'm thinking? We'll do another one. This one would be a little easier. I'm thinking of some food that I can eat at a restaurant within a 100-mile radius. What food am I thinking of? Well, that's easy. I, I narrowed it to 100 miles. You see, the problem with most religion today is that we tell you we know what God's thinking. We can look at the stars and we can look at the ocean and we can look through our microscopes and we got God all figured out. But what we don't say enough is that the only way we can know what God is thinking is if God tells us what He is thinking. The book of Romans, the first two chapters tell us, you can know that there is a God from looking at the stars, but you can't tell what He wants until He stands before you and says, here's what I want. And that is through Jesus Christ. No one knows anything about God of any real matter until they encounter Jesus Christ. He is the witness. I have seen your salvation. This is the words of the prophet Simeon as he saw the baby Jesus. I have seen your salvation, God, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Simeon is making a statement. This is the witness. This is the eyewitness account right here. Jesus Christ. You will not know what the kingdom of God is. You will not know what it wants. You will not know where it is until you encounter the witness who is the only man who ever saw it up close. Whoever was part of it. Whoever experienced it. And the only thing that people around you want is what you experienced and saw and felt when you met Jesus. 
And so, once again, you're the witness. And all a witness does is say, well, I saw the truck that hit you. That's all they say. They don't say, well, I think the guy was crazy. You're not an expert witness, and you didn't talk to him. You don't know. So what you do, you start by giving peace. We see a witness go up before the judge, and what does he do? He swears that he's going to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth. He's declaring peace to the courtroom. There's nothing that we have against us. We're not at war. You tell your friends and your neighbors, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a good Joe. I'm going to be a good neighbor. There's no problem between us. And then you eat with them to show that there is friendship. There's camaraderie. There's fellowship. Not the kind of fellowship that Christians enjoy, but the kind of fellowship that neighbors can enjoy. That if there's a trouble between us, we're going to talk about it. And when we have free time, we're going to chat. And you can trust me. And then when they share that difficult time in their life, we're going to pray for them. And here's what I want to nail home today. The reason we are not witnessing is because we're not seeing anything. And the reason we're not testifying is because there's nothing to testify about if we haven't seen anything. And so here is your assignment. Ask God to show himself. Ask him to say, here I am. And I'll tell you how that's going to happen. You go over to this neighbor that you've declared peace and that you've eaten with, and you find out what troubles them in the course of your friendship, and you say, can I pray for that? And they say, I don't believe in God. And you say, I don't care. And you pray for them right there. Lord, I pray that you come and tackle this problem. Lord, I pray you run right into this problem and you make yourself known to this person. And I guarantee you that very shortly they're going to come to you and they're going to say, you'll never guess what happened. And that's when you, that's when you get to say, I saw the truck that hit you. And I know the driver. And I know where he lives. And I'll testify to that fact. And you know what's going to happen? Well, they're still not going to believe in many cases. And that's okay. Because then you start again. And you repeat as often as needed. But never once do you walk away from that and say, well, then I'm done with you. Because that's not love and that's not friendship. There are times, there are times when you put less effort into a project, and that's true. There are times when someone is so hostile to your message that there is no peace, and that's true. But as long as there's peace, and as long as there are meals, and as long as there is someone saying, well, yeah, you can pray for me, do whatever, then the truck is going to keep running into them as long as you're asking for it. And the driver is still going to be the same driver of that truck. And you're still going to witness. Okay, for the 47th accident, I'm telling you who the driver is. And I know where he lives. And you can go meet him. And eventually... Either they're going to just give up listening to you or they're going to try to meet that driver because of your testimony, not because of your opinions. Because of your witness, not because of your hearsay. So witness by asking God to show himself and not just waiting for some miracle to happen. Ask him for it to happen. Next week, we're going to start a summer-long sermon series on the life of a man who was after God's own heart. And what amazes me about this guy is that when you read him, you would never, ever, ever let your daughter date him or your son hang out with him. Because he was a scoundrel in so many ways. 
And yet God continued to say, there's a man after my heart. And we're going to learn what that means because strangely enough, King David is considered to be a type or an image of Christ in the Old Testament. But I disagree. I don't think that he's an image of Christ. I think he's an image of us, the Christians, the people who are scoundrels in one way or another. But because they listen to God and they admit that God is right and I am wrong, they become the person after God's own heart. So I hope you join us this summer or at least download the YouTube or something. Because if we're going to be people that declare peace and have meals with strangers and pray for them and witness to them, we have to have a character like David that says, I'm a scoundrel, but at least I know where truth is and love and forgiveness really comes from. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the way that you saved me and the way that you've saved others. I thank you that your patience is infinite. I thank you for the way your forgiveness has no limits. I thank you for how your love does not keep a record of wrongs. And loves right through my shortcomings. But Lord, change me so that I see no shortcomings in my neighbor. That my love works through the problems of my neighbor's life. So that I might be more like you, my Father. And reach out to those who are near me, but who do not agree with me. Or who do not know me. Or who have rejected the truth be able to say like Christ, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And give up of my time and my comfort and even my very life so that others may live. In Jesus' name, amen. Now's the time that we have an invitation for you to come forward. And you know, when we have a whole room full of Christians, you don't always expect somebody to come forward. But I do want you in your own heart during this time to examine your